All right. Thanks for the in-person crowd. We are practicing social distancing, so nobody write me up. All right. I got a few smiles. Wonderful. Good. All right. So we can talk about Alabama EMS Challenge. For those of y'all that are new to the course online, this was set up about uh, six years ago to bring free Con Ed, physicians that Con Ed to the region with the goal to improve patient care and improve relationships between the EMS, the ER nurses and ER physicians. So you can read this over. This is the goal. We're here the second and fourth Wednesday of each month. Um, we also do cadaver labs and sim labs. Uh, we hope to uh, near fall, November ish, maybe even take some of the classes on the road and do on site locations, maybe at your fire department, do the lectures and then spend the day doing sim labs or uh, skills. For your roster, for your certificate today, uh, email Alabama EMS Challenge. Chief will also put some information up in the uh, chat box on how to get your certificate. Um, if you can do the email version, do that by two o'clock today so we can get this stuff out. Um, sometimes it takes a few days. Remember, there's just a few of us doing this. We have no admin support, so give us a little bit of time. Um, regional updates. Remember, protocols came out June 14th. There were some significant changes. Chest decompression went to category A. We had a cadaver lab last week at UAB uh, using social distancing. Uh, we were only get 88 people in there, but that was still plenty of folks. We practiced chest decompression, uh, practiced IO skills, and talked about tracheostomy care. The next one should be in March. If you missed it, you need to get in one of these at least every now and then. Um, other protocols we talk about, atropine has now gone one milligram, uh, and TXA is now uh, two grams in its category A. So if you're not carrying TXA, I'd recommend that. It's great for hemorrhagic shock unless you're carrying blood or even if you are carrying blood. It's a low cost drug, easy to use, limited risk. If you have questions about it, please feel free to email Chief or myself. Um, COVID is still here. Remember guys, wear your PPE. Uh, we don't want to get ill. We also don't want to get ourselves exposed to be out of work. Um, everybody's short staff right now. Wall times, we were doing great with wall times uh, pre-COVID in the uh, early winter. That has now gone away and I, you guys know that already. Um, if there are significant wall times, please email me that. Uh, the big thing I want to stress is we cannot have crews that take a patient to a hospital and then be asked to go back out in the rescue and wait. That's poor form. Um, with the heat, there have been heat exposures. I've had two or three cases of that. And also patients have been de uh, have, uh, decompensated in the rescue. And they've had to call med control, go to other facilities. So if you are an ER person here listening, please don't send the crews back uh, to the rescue. Uh, I understand there's some long wall times. Keep them inside in case we need your resources and we definitely need your AC, okay? System entry, remember early entry for TCC for trauma, stroke, and STEMI, very important. I also wanted to mention something about diversion status. Remember, diversion is just a reminder from the ER to EMS that, hey, we're pretty busy, expect to wait, okay? Now, I don't agree with the wait, but that's what we got these days. Um, diversion does not mean you cannot take someone there. Obviously, patient wish wishes should override most requests. Um, the governor still has an emergency mandate, so due to COVID, you can alter the patient's destination hospital based upon the region needs, not just the patient request. Okay, so we can do that. All right. If you have issues with that, always talk to online man control. They can help you with that. Um, DEA rules and regulations. Remember, the DEA is pretty strict these days. There have been providers in the past that have diverted drugs and have had their license revoked and had to get through training, remediation and therapy, which is all very reasonable. There have also been cases in the region where someone has diverted drugs, had all that happen and then had criminal charges pressed against them. So please be very careful with the drugs. Make sure you're using your uh, controlled substance plan. Make sure you're being wise with that and make sure your medical director is in line with everything you're doing for your sake. All right. And lastly, medical direction. If you need help with medical direction, reach out. I can find somebody for you. If you're in the Brims region in a non-transporting agency, I'm happy to help. There's no charge for that. Anybody else, reach out. We can help you with that as well as needed. All right. Uh, Post-ketamine, again, this comes up frequently. Ketamine is used for excited delirium and also pain control in our region. I'm more the, the guy that thinks that we should use it for excited delirium, not so much pain control, but it's out there if you're doing that. Remember, anybody that gets ketamine, at that point in the game, they are a critical patient. All right, you expose them, you look for life threats, they get attached to the monitor. They get capnography if you have it, nasal capnography. If you don't, not a big deal. Use your cardiac monitor and your SAT probe. However, if they become hypoxic, we do not put oxygen on these people. Okay, the problem is not oxygenation, it's ventilation. All right, if they become hypoxic, we reposition the airway, jaw thrust, maybe a nasal trumpet. If that fixes them, we high five our partner, 
and keep going to the hospital. If they're still hypoxic, at that point, we do positive pressure ventilation with oxygen. We cannot do just oxygen. Remember, <clears throat> somebody who has ketamine is now breathing three or four times a minute. You put high flow O2 on them, they're going to keep their sats up for eight to 10 minutes until they become hypercapnic, okay, and they can go into cardiac arrest. So post-ketamine patients are critically ill. You expose them, you look for life threats, you get an ACU check, you get vital signs, they're on the monitor, they're on capnography if you got it, and they get hypoxic, they do not get just oxygen, okay? Sometimes these folks get ketamine for excited delirium, they slow the breathing down, you open the airway, they don't get better, you start bagging them, they don't get better, you can intubate those folks. That's reasonable, okay? If you just throw O2 on them, something bad's gonna happen. Dosing, I'm not gonna mention dosing a lot with ketamine. Um, it is on ideal body weight, not total body weight, but that's for another day. We've talked about that several times. You can go back. Um, our YouTube channel has uh, probably six, eight videos on it now, Chief, is that correct? Yeah, somewhere around there. So those are up there because you can look at that. For also on the Brent, we're gonna uh, hopefully in the next few months, put the YouTube videos on the BRIMS webpage, the learning system there, so you can watch the YouTube video and get credit for it. National Registry has kind of waived the non-distributive requirements now, so you can get video uh, uh, credit. Um, all right, so we'll talk about EKGs. Big push for this original concepts of paramedicine was three lead recognition uh, in the 70s and early 80s. The reason being people in third degree hot block need quick pacing, medications, treatment for that. People in VTAC or VFib, that needs to be managed immediately or people die, okay? We didn't have a lot of other uh, input or things we can do for STEMIs at that point in the game. We do now. So as paramedics or the gurus of three lead interpretation, you guys also gotta be the 12 lead gurus from now on. So we gotta move forward. We gotta read our 12 leads ourselves and not just trust the machines. So I look at 12 leads as a screening tool. A pragmatic approach. Is it too fast, too slow, or okay-ish? Too fast, I like AC, uh, American Heart's wide or narrow versus regular or irregular, okay? With the too slow, I think about three things, drugs, electrolytes, or ischemia. And then if they're okay, those are the ones that are complicated. If the rate's between 50 and 140-ish, then you think, what's going on? Is there electrolyte abnormality? Is there a STEMI? Is there ischemia? Is there some kind of drug ingestion? Is there an infection? What is going on? So those are the real scary ones, okay? All right, you got to be able to figure out your rate without looking at your monitor. So when the machine prints off that 12 lead, you can figure out what's going on. When I use the box, I say first box is 300, 150, 175. It's not a person that's that. I can dare you. What now? <laughs> All right, guys. So you got to know how to calculate your rate. Okay. So I use the box method 300, 150, 175. After that, I don't care until I get to box seven or eight. And at that point, my mind's kind of wandering. I'm thinking about other things than I think bradycardia. But you got to have a way to calculate your rate. There are different ways to do it. This is the way I do it. Okay. You got to know intervals. So you got to know the PR interval while that's important. So we learned in paramedic school and nursing school about first degree heart blocks, prolonged PR. Clinically, that's not a scary thing. We don't do much for that, but a prolonged PR can also be indicative of hyperkalemia, which can kill people. So you gotta understand that. QRS complex, you gotta know what that is because we're gonna use that wide versus where tachydus really is. And we get more advanced branch blocks, that's gonna be important to know as well. Also important to think about people. One of the first things we look at is the QT interval. All right, there are a lot of folks out there on medications that prolong this, and this can lead to torsades or VTAC. If you don't recognize this, you may miss this and PRT somebody or send somebody home that does not at the house. So too fast, too slow, or okay. I'll say this rate is okay. The machine said, I count my box going 300, 150, 175. So in the 70 range, so I'm good with that. Right? So I'm looking at my rate, my rate is okay patterns and I kind of do it the same way every time so when I'm tired I've been up two days I don't miss something in the morning right so I look at lead one AVL and leads five and six and I'm looking for ST elevation or ST depression if I have ST elevation in any two of these leads that is a STEMI right and 
our monitors will pick this up 70% of the time. All right. Next place I go look fairly at 23 AVF, and I'm looking for elevation or depression. So ST elevation, or maybe even some depression, sorry, ischemia. If I got two leads there with ST elevation, that is an inferior STEMI. Next thing I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at V1 through V4. These are septal leads here. Down the middle part and our anterior leads here. Okay. In the middle and in the front. All right. Big there. So elevation here for anterior in part. You also think T depression. So if this is the front part, this is look at the back side of the heart. So ST depression concerning for posterior infarct. You don't have to do one of those fancy back-sided posterior 12 leads. This is diagnostic. You see this in two leads, posterior STEMI, okay? You call it, move on down. The last ABR. So ABR, we used to say ABR was good for looking for lead placement. If you're up in one and you're down in ABR, leads are on correctly. In reality, ABR is pretty important. If you think about where this is anatomically, this is a points toward the aortic cuff where both the vessels come off the right coronary. So if this is elevated and we have depression anywhere else in the pattern. So if this is up and I'm down inferiorly, or if this is up and I'm down laterally, or if that is up and I'm down in any of these with uh, ST depression, that is what we call a STEMI equivalent. That's concerning for a proximal left coronary STEMI, very bad, okay? So now this can also go up in the 80 year old with known heart disease who is now septic and hypotensive and tachycardic. You'll see them as a tachycardic, this, and this drops. And they don't need heart cath, they need to be fixed their sepsis, right? You need to slow the heart rate down, increase the blood pressure. But elevation in AVR is a stimulant. And I can tell you right now, majority of the 12 lead machines out there are not going to read that. That's going to be up to you to pick that up. And you can see this is something I swiped off the internet, but it kind of shows locations. I'm talking about why AVR is important. Use of the right main, right coronary, which is your inferior, circumflex, and left main. Any questions within reason from internet land? Not yet. I wish we could see faces, see if anybody's awake. That's what we really need to see. All right, sorry. All right, case. 59 year old male complaints of chest pain. So we teach our med students in to do history on a patient and then do their physical. We don't have that luxury. We do it all at the same time. We're getting our history as our hands are on the patient, as we're getting our vital signs and doing our diagnostic. Everything is at once. So 59 year old guy with chest pain, we're going to be asking pertinent questions while we're doing our exam. Impertinent questions, so things that matter. So the questions that we're asking on this guy is we're trying to risk stratify. Is this chest pain concerning? OK, is he high risk for having acute coronary syndrome and heart disease? So are you a diabetic? OK, first question, diabetes is a big cause of coronary artery disease. Next question I would ask is, do you take shots or pills? Keep it simple, right? If they take shots, you assume that they're on insulin and a type one, higher risk for early coronary artery disease, okay? Other questions I say, have you ever had a heart attack before? Any heart disease, ever had a stroke? Those are big risk factors to make me think this chest pain is concerning or not. Now, obviously I'm always gonna treat all chest pains as concerning until something bad is ruled out, okay? But we're using our history questions to risk stratify, okay? I don't really care if the dude's had both knees replaced, okay, if he's had shoulder surgery and he has dental implants. Doesn't have any bearing on his health problems right now, okay? All right. You think about social history, I think about alcohol, drugs, and tobacco. Obviously, the dude's smoking when you show up. That's a big risk factor as well, all right? Family history, anybody in your family have a heart attack before the age of 40? Keep it simple. If they say yes to that, you know there's a big genetic component. If not, who cares? If they say, yeah, my dad had a heart attack, but he was 86, that seems reasonable. That's not a risk factor for this guy, okay? And then medication use, things I think about, hey, dude, any cocaine today? Anything that makes me think very high risk. 
So that's what our questions are used for to risk draft by how serious, how fast should I move on evaluation of this patient? OK. Now, obviously, we're going to get vital signs. Dude's a little bit hypertensive. That's probably normal tensive for Alabama. Heart rate is reasonable. OK, and I'm checking a pulse lat because I'm feeling for irregularity. I'm also seeing is his skin warm or dry? A lot of information. Breathing about 14 times a minute. More important is worker breathing. Accessory muscle use. Is he sitting upright? Is he tripoding? But respirations are reasonable. Satin fine. If I'm getting the IV, I'm getting the glucose. Gives you a lot of data. If it reads low, we can fix it. If it reads high, we know they have diabetes. We're concerned for DKA, other issues. Anything in between, I don't really care. I'm not going to manage that in the field or the ER. Okay, sweet. So this is the EKG class, so this is the EKG. Is that too fast, too slow, or okay? So machine says it's 64. Machine is usually right. I've already had my hand on the guy's pulse. Feels fairly regular. All right, I'm gonna do the box method. 300, 100, 150, 75. So 70 ish, 60 to 70, reasonable, okay? It's not less than 50, it's not more than 140. So it's okay. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look for injury patterns. I'm gonna look at leads one, AVL, and lateral. I'm gonna go back and look at leads two, three, and AVF. V1 through V4. I'm gonna look at AVL. Next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back and look at my PR interval, my QRS, my QT. And then before I lay this thing back down, I'm gonna look at it one more time to make sure I don't miss something because there's some days I've been up way too long and not enough coffee or monster, right? So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna look at these one. That looks pretty concerning. That's a little bit elevated. It's about a block. BL, that makes me very uncomfortable. Five and six, that's elevated. That looks reasonable. So right now I've got elevation in one, AV. Right. So I agree with the machine. Looks like a lateral skin. OK. I'm going to still go back and look at 2, 3 and AVF. You can see we got these T wave changes here. These are reciprocal changes. This makes me even more convinced this is going on. B1 through B4 looks reasonable. B4 has got a little bit of elevation as well. And AVR looks fine. So uh, all health history, all that does not matter. Because those questions would have risk stratified. Does he have a for acute coronary syndrome? Doesn't matter. Because is it right? Even if dude is now having the stim. Right? So very significant EKG. All right. If you got two guys on scene with this guy, one guy should be managing this patient. The other one should be sending this to TCC to make sure that we're getting an appropriate cath lab hospital available for this guy or knowing where to go with him. All right. So mnemonics, I'm not a big mnemonic guy. I like two mnemonics. I like ABC, all right? Learned that a long time ago. And then STEMI, mnemonic out there, right? I know this is kind of basic stuff for those of you that watch everything. I start with the nitro, all right? I'm gonna start with the A for aspirin. Folks, aspirin is and long-term outcomes. What aspirin does is where the infarct is, blood flow is going this way. The body's response to the plaques is to this. I'm trying to fix the problem. The problem is the platelets stick to get bigger and eventually get complete occlusion. And then the person has what uh, aspirin does, aspirin jacks up the platelets to, to combine each other and knocks off those receptors. So now they play this just float downstream and the clot does not get bigger. Uh, it doesn't break, but it makes a clot. So that's aspirin. It's this vessel, gives you more blood flow. It also lowers the blood pressure. Remember heart, people who are bradycardic, people who are super tachycardic, 50, and people who are less than 100, probably should not get. So before we give nitrogen, IVF as a start of fluid bolus in case you get a big rebound. Ask some questions. What questions should we ask? I lost most of my crowd, so I can't ask anybody. Uh, but remember, folks on uh, Viagra, Cialis, people with pulmonary hypertension already on those long-acting nitrates, you are, uh, are medications. You do not want to give them nitro. 
There's a big risk. You get a uh, uh, marked response. Hypotension. Morphine. Morphine is an archaic. Go from having chest pain to like, I got chest pain, but I don't care. I'm high as a kite. All right. But morphine is an odor narcotic. It causes a histamine release. So what you can do with that is when you get the morphine, you get some vasodilatation, which may improve flow downstream. If they're hypotensive, you can't do it. So obviously aspirin is first. Nitro is next. Morphine will be your third line. And then the O is for oxygen. So American Heart says you do not give oxygen for people with SAT less than 94%. There's good data that says long-term high flow O2 is bad on people. All right. However, <clears throat> when you think about risk to benefit, people who are having a STEMI are high risk for cardiac arrest, VTAC, VFib. So people who have STEMIs, they get oxygen from me, and I call it pre-oxygenation, okay, before they go into cardiac arrest, even if they're not dyspic. It makes it easier if you're the back of the truck and the patient goes into cardiac arrest and they already have O2 on, you can crank that O2 up to six liters, start CPR, you got passive oxygenation, you can go ahead and get them defibrillated if need be. So I call it pre-oxygenation. I don't call it supplemental O2. There's limited risk to that, okay? And there's no data that shows that high flow O2 on somebody for the first four to six hours is bad. There's no data out there. So risk to benefit, this guy gets oxygen. If his EKG was normal, he would not because he was not tachypnic nor hypoxic. We talked about monitoring 12 leads, talked about nitro and aspirin. All right, so when you ask it about medication histories and things like that, now we're risk stratifying to determine the benefit of the medicines we're given. So we asked our other questions to figure out, is his chest pain really high risk for ACS? That doesn't matter anymore. He's having a STEMI, we know that. Now, when we ask about medication use, history, allergies, we think about risk to benefit for other medicines. So I would ask now about the Viagra or Cialis, because if I give nitro, there's a risk I can hurt him and not help him from that, okay? Does that make sense, kind of? Anybody in the room that's awake? All right, thank you for smiling. Hey, Dr. Person, I did. It might be useful to talk about one thing real quick. Sure. Um, I know a lot of times, and, and I've certainly done this a lot, um, we ask questions like, uh, with a chest pain patient, does your pain get worse when you take a deep breath? Does it hurt when I press on your chest? And um, I think those are reasonable questions to ask to try to risk stratify the patient, as you say. Yeah. The problem is, I think a lot of times, when the patient gives the wrong answer to those to indicate a coronary problem, we just are completely dismissive and say, well, it's not cardiac right. then. And, and you really can't do that, can you? No. So when you think about classical findings for chest pain and ACS or heart attacks, uh, to get a, get a definition of a classical finding, that means 25% of the people that have that disease should have that symptom. So if a classic STEMI chest pain patient is, oh, I'm diaphoretic, I have chest pain that radiates to my jaw and my left shoulder and I'm short of breath. That means that if you have 100 people having heart attacks, 25 have that, the other 75 do not. So you cannot rule out a heart attack by them saying, yeah, it hurts when I take a deep breath or I push on my chest. Those are questions that give you information to kind of look for something. Um, so for example, I had a guy that complained of belly pain I saw uh, last fall and I said, uh, can you describe it to me? He said it's sharp, it was initially sharp and kind of stabbing. Uh, now it's dull, if I push on it or belch, anything I do hurts. And the short story to that is when I pull up a shirt, he had been stabbed the day before. So it was sharp and stabbing when it first started. Now it was dull. That was kind of funny. Ha <laughs> ha. He was an Alabama guy, but I won't tell you that story here. I get in trouble. So yes, your point is you do have to ask those questions, but those cannot lead you to a false sense of security. So I've had people that have come in that said, yeah, my chest pain is kind of on the right side. I'm a little bit short of breath. And they've had big stimmies. Okay. But if you have someone that has, they have chest pain and it's hurts when they take a deep breath, that should make you think, okay, do they have some kind of pleuritic pain? Is this a PE? So you can think about other things as well, but you still got to rule out ACS on those folks. And so we have another question that came, just came in. Um, what, or would the patient being on beta blockers affect our treatment in the pre-hospital setting? Yes, no, it will affect their presentation. So it will make someone who should be tachycardic, not tachycardic, is a beta blocker, right? So if you had a septic patient that was on a beta blocker, they may feel bad, be hypotensive, and not be tachycardic because of that beta blocker. 
All right. But from ACS standpoint, none of your medicines should do that. No. Again, I recommend before you give nitro to any STEMI patient, they have IV access. So if you do drop their blood pressure, you can give them a fluid bolus and kind of rescue them from that nitro. All right. Sweet. <clears throat> I've already kind of talked my spiel about O2. Kyle would not need it except for he's having a STEMI. So now he gets pre-oxygenation. He also gets defib pads because the biggest cause of death in STEMIs in the first four hours is dysrhythmia, VTAC, VFib, or heart block. All right. All chest pains don't get defib pads. You'll run broke. Your supervisor will get mad at you. But STEMIs should get defib pads and nasal cannula. Remember, the two main causes of VFib or VTAC is coronary artery disease, big STEMIs, and the other one is congestive heart failure or structural heart defects where the heart gets larger and larger and has difficulty making conduction of electrical impulses and they're prone to VTAC or VFib. That's why folks who have congestive heart failure, when the heart failure gets to about, you know, less than 30 percent, 35 percent, these guys usually get an automatic internal defibrillator place so they don't go into VTAC or VFib and die at home. Yeah. Yes. Hey, so we got another question. Um, I've heard that morphine affects the effectiveness of anticoagulants. Yes, there's some data out there that it does. And they therefore prefer fentanyl. Do you have an opinion on this? So I think when someone's having chest pain from a STEMI, their pain is coming because their heart is ischemic. So I don't think that morphine or fentanyl, either one is going to fix the problem. We're going to change their mind and make them feel like they feel better, but it's not going to fix the problem, right? It's like when your legs asleep, taking a Tylenol is not going to help it. Your leg has to kind of wake up, right? Same thing with the heart. So there's some data that morphine jacks up some of the anticoagulation in the cath lab, all right? But morphine also lowers the blood pressure. So in a way, it's kind of good from that standpoint. Fentanyl is reasonable. It doesn't mess up the coagulation, the anticoagulation in the cath lab, but it doesn't lower the blood pressure. So if you can help pain and blood pressure with nitro and control pain with fentanyl, that's very reasonable. That's probably the best alternative. There is no place for ketamine, in my opinion, in cardiac chest pain. There's no place. One, it's going to increase heart rate, increase blood pressure a little bit, which is good in some patients, but not this one. And two, it may mess up their mental status and buy them an ET tube before they go to the cath lab. So I'm not a big fan of ketamine in, in cardiac pain, but the fentanyl was reasonable. Yeah. So if you had someone with congestive heart failure and flash pulmonary edema, pulmonary edema in somebody who is super hypertensive, I would prefer morphine over fentanyl because that's going to be an additional effect of lowering the blood pressure. But for STEMIs, either one is fine. All right, this is a, a case, I want to say it was out of Birmingham. Uh, I forgot what year, last June maybe. Um, <clears throat> Too fast, too slow, or okay. I said the rate's reasonable. Machine says 78. I got 300, 150, 175, so I'm good with that. But we see we got big elevation, inferior. We got it all through the septal anterior leads and lateral. So this guy's having a big freaking MI. These are the tombstones we used to talk about, or in the 80s, we'd call these the Pac Man ghost, right? So the uh, Big, big STEMI. Biggest cause of death for these folks in the first four hours is dysrhythmia. So this patient was placed on O2. They got IV access. They got nitro by Birmingham en route to the hospital. Went to VFib. They'd already placed the pads on the guy. They were able to charge and defibrillate. They got ROSC. Dude came into the ER yelling and cussing, uncomfortable. He got good pain control and off to the cath lab and did fine. Had they not had the pads on him, they would have done CPR for a few minutes. Maybe have to pull a truck over, get some help. Delay intervention, which is defibrillation, which may have prolonged his arrest. And he could have had a hypoxic brain injury from that. So the point being, STEMIs get oxygen. They also get defib pads. The way we treat these guys in the hospital, they go to the cath lab or we give them a thrombolytic, depending on where you work, the time of day, and how busy your cath lab is. A couple of drugs out there that we can use. TPA is the same drug that we use for uh, strokes. It's a clot buster. 
We talked about how aspirin makes this clot not get bigger. When I give TPA, what it does is it takes this clot and dissolves these strands that hold it together, so the clot floats downstream, so it opens it up. Okay. Most people with a STEMI have heart disease, so they have plaque along the vessel wall, and one of those plaques break off and cause a clot. So we rescue them with TPA. This opens up, and then a few hours later, still go to the cath lab, and they usually put a stent in to keep that from happening. TNK is another one, tenecteplase. It's a one-time dose. dose. And I've used that at some facilities. It depends on where you work. Retivase is a drug that is used pre-hospital in other states. Okay, it's a two-dose regime. You give, I think it's 10 units. So EMS shows up on scene. Guy has appropriate history. He has <clears throat> a STEMI on 12 lead. They screen him to make sure he's a patient that can take a thrombolytic, and they give 10 units of retivase. If his EKG gets better, his pain is resolved, he gets to the hospital, he goes to the cath lab in a couple of hours. If it doesn't, he gets to the hospital, he gets a second use dose of retivase and goes to the cath lab right then. So this is coming to our area at some point. We're not there yet. We've got to get better with our 12 leads, but this is ma good management of STEMI's pre-hospital, especially if you're out of the greater Birmingham area or one of the hubs in the, uh, Alabama where you got 20, 30, 40 minute transport times. Hey, Dr. Ferguson, how does uh, the patient's medications affect use of TPA? For example, if they're having a STEMI, PCI is not available, and they're taking Coumadin or Eliquis or one of the other. Right, so that, the, those are what we call relative contraindications. There's more risk for bleeding. However, with STEMI patients, you can still do that. Now, a stroke patient who is on Coumadin and their blood level, the thinness of the INR is too high, you're hosed. They can't get TPA. They got to go in for a clot retrieval. For STEMI patients, it's a little bit different. Okay. The difference is if you got a weakness in your vessel, if you have an ischemic stroke and you give somebody TPA and their blood's already thin, there's a big risk for a bleed in the brain. Right? And you can't hold a lot of blood in the brain. People die from that. Folks having STEMIs probably don't have a lesion in their brain. Anywhere else you bleed, we can relatively control that. Okay. So this thermolytic checklist is in our protocols. State says you got to fill it out on every STEMI you take in and give it to the hospital. I'm just saying what they say, but I will say this. You should know these questions. You should ask the patient this question if they're having a STEMI. And if nothing else, you should know the answer, write it on your glove. And this should be data that you provide to that doc when you get to the hospital. Because you show up at the hospital with the STEMI, as soon as you transfer him over, he goes into V-fib arrest. I shock him a few times, I give him some amio, we get him intubated, and he's not better in six to eight minutes. I'm thinking about giving him a thrombolytic. And if you didn't ask the questions, and I didn't know he just had brain surgery three weeks ago, I've done nothing for this guy, all right? I can't give him a thrombolytic at that point in the game because I would kill him. So these questions are very important. I recommend you know these, you ask these questions to your patients, all right? And you pass that information on to the receiving physician at the hospital. Okay, so that was kind of the quick run through of STEMIs. We got a few minutes. I wanna talk about some tackies real quick and then uh, do a few EKGs, then we'll take a break. So 70 year old male, history of smoking, maybe some COPD. Uh, he said no other past medical history, probably has a lot of other health problems. Um, he's short of breath, tachycardic, he's weak for seven days. Family finally got tired of him sitting on the side of the bed, huffing and puffing and called EMS. He's been nauseous, he's diaphoretic, he looks like dirt, he's ashen, okay? Blood pressure is 110 over 68, he's breathing 32 times a minute. His SAT is 92% on four liters by your first responders. His pulse is regular and fast. Glucose is slightly elevated at 364. This does not give me a lot of data, but it tells me he is a diabetic. Okay. And that's his 12 lead. So I'd say too fast, too slow, or okay-ish. I'd say it verges on the cusp of being too fast. I use 140 to 150 to being too fast. So it's right there on the cuff, all right? So rate's a little bit fast. He is not unstable, not unresponsive. So I'm gonna go ahead and interpret this 12 lead. I'm gonna look at leads one 
L and five and six. I got depression here and there. All right, I don't see elevation. Two, three and AVF looks very concerning. It's not a STEMI, but deep T wave inverted there. V1 through V4, I would say those T waves were inverted. I don't really see much ST depression. There are T wave inversions though, so no ST depression. Since I want to call it a posterior STEMI, it's a concerning EKG. And the last thing I look at is lead AVR. And you see in lead AVR, AVR is elevated. So I got a 70 year old guy who's been dysmic, short of breath, and he states tachycardic for a week up in AVR and down the everywhere else, right? Down laterally. He's down through his interior portion of his heart, and the whole right side of his heart is down too. So this is a STEMI equivalent. All right, so big concerns there. And I guess the other thing we need to think about is after we've looked at this, I want to know what kind of rhythm this is because it is kind of fast. So my QRS is fairly narrow. I'm looking for P waves. I don't really see much. I got a P wave and a T wave. So PR is either prolonged or something else is going on with that. So a regular complex narrow QRS rhythm in the rates of 140 to 150 always makes me think a flutter, okay? So we've already talked about hands on the pulse. It was diaphoretic, but his rate was regular. So this is kind of an A flutter or atrial tachycardia at a rate of 140, but it's also a STEMI equivalent. So this is a complicated EKG. So the question is, how do you manage that? Okay. So you manage it so like we do AFib. AFib, A flutter, you manage the same. So before we talk about management, kind of quick review AFib. Okay. AFib causes two problems, decreased cardiac output because you lose the atrial kick, the preload and push you get. And because the atrium is jacked up in fibbing, you get thrombus formation. So AFib normal conduction for, uh, from uh, cardiac is SA node to AV node, nice wave electricity. AFib is different. For some reason, this atrium is probably enlarged because of disease or because of stress or because of a big PE or something. And so you got different foci or points where everything gets um, stimulated. So you get spasmodic contraction of the atria and regular contraction of the ventricle. All right. Causes of AFib or a flutter, you treat them both about the same. Long term hypertension causes the cardiac vessel to enlarge. So you get a change in conduction system. You get a flutter. A flutter sometimes is a precursor to AFib. Thyroid issues we won't talk about. Acute alcohol, young person, if there's a 20 year old comes in with AFib, a flutter, I think about either thyroid or alcohol, some kind of weird toxin. Okay. Smoking some crack can do it for you. Common things though are pulmonary problems. So COPD long term, pulmonary embolism. Okay. Sometimes electrolytes can cause it, magnesium issues, heart failure, cardiomyopathy, and that's all due to pulmonary problems or hypertension. So those are the big causes with this. Patients with AFib or A-flutter can have syncope, palpitations. All right, they can get thrombus that cause strokes, mesenteric ischemia, big risk for that. A-flutter is similar to AFib, except it's usually more regular. It's more of a circuit. It's made in the atria. As that atria stretches out and starts to give way and go into AFib. Textbook talks about the saw tooth pattern. That's there, but it's not as common as the kind of mixed pattern what you see with the tachycardias. So here's another one. You see a flutter, but controlled ventricular response versus the one that we had a little while ago that was a fib, a flutter with rapid ventricular response. So management of a fib or a flutter determines the rate, the problem, the response. Obviously, if someone is older, has a history of a fib or a flutter and they're septic, they won't go into size tack, they go into AFib or a flutter with RVR. You treat the underlying problem. However, some folks can go into this AFib, a flutter, RVR for the cardiac reasons, and the rate is actually the problem causing the issues with those folks. This is my favorite video. Don't know why. So the way we manage this in the ER with a stable AFib, a flutter is we think about 
uh, ruling out big issues, make it, make sure there's no big blood clot in the heart that we get when we shock them or convert them out of AFib a flutter in a normal sinus that we cause a stroke. Most of the time we do rate control with beta blockers or diltiazem, and you recognize diltiazem is a drug that we can carry in the field now. Esmolol is a drip related beta blocker, works pretty good. We can control the rhythm, rhythm with procanamide, older drug, complicated to use, but it's out there, or amio. We can use amio for any kind of tachy dysrhythmia. Hey, Dr. Ferguson. Yes. For the longest, uh, after we got a denison in the pre-hospital setting, you know, it was a cardinal sin to give a patient with AFib a denison. Yeah. Is, it, is that still a cardinal sin? No, it is not a cardinal sin. No. So, narrow complex tachys, you can give a denison. Now, is a denison going to fix AFib? It's not going to fix the problem, right? Because the problem is the atria is fibrillating. And that's making the, the ventricle, ventricular ventricles. <laughs> I like that word. The ventricular rate way too fast, right? So AFib is going to block that uh, AV node, and you're going to see AFib on the monitor, and then you can get that response back. But it's, it's not a cardinal sin. I don't personally use adenosine on AFib, RVR, and a YQRS, because my thought is if they have a Y complex QRS and they have some kind of accessory pathway through the heart, and I block that AV node. So SA node, AV node, this is fibbing. I got fast ventricular rate here, okay? Y complex QRS, AFib, and I block this node and there's an accessory pathway through here. So there's a risk theoretically that they go from AFib to VFib and that's poor form to do it. It's pretty cool, you get to shock them, but it's poor form for the patients. If it's a narrow complex QRS, AFib RVR, there's probably not an accessory pathway, so it's safe to use that. Now, American Heart says you can use adenosine with known AFib RVR Y complex. I have colleagues that do it. I just don't particularly do it. So unstable AFib A flutter is pretty scary to manage because if you think about someone with an AFib A flutter rated 150, 160, and they're already hypotensive, all the modalities we have to treat them will make you drop your blood pressure. So if I give them a beta blocker to slow their heart rate down, it lowers the blood pressure. And if the BP is already low, you can't do that. Same thing with dotizum, okay? You can do rhythm control, which is procanamide. Kind of works, but takes a while. Or amio, same thing, okay? Um, you can also do cardioversion. But the problem you got to think about is why are they AFib RVR or a flood or RVR? If it's due to sepsis or stress or dehydration, you treat that problem because cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. AFib, A flutters have decreased stroke volume. So if their heart rate is up because of some kind of cardiac stress and you slow that heart rate down, you can make them crash. The point of that is this guy probably has underlying health problems, underlying coronary artery disease. We know he's 70, he's got diabetes from an AccuCheck, he's COPD. He's having a STEMI but his symptoms have been going on for seven days. So one food for thought would be that for seven days, he's had this big heart problem, had a big STEMI, and a, that covers most of the heart. So now his heart function is down. So now for cardiac, his heart rate is up, all right? So if I give this guy a dose of dotizum or a beta blocker, and I slow his heart rate down into the <laughs> and down to the 50s, what I've done now is basically taken away his cardiac output. So remember, cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. His stroke volume was already depressed, so that's why his heart rate went up. And now I drop his heart rate, and now I'm going to drop his cardiac output. So guy goes from heart rate of 150, blood pressure of 110, looking like dirt, to a heart rate of 50, blood pressure of 60, not now not talking to you. So the point of this is AFib, A flutter, folks, can be very challenging to manage. Okay. When someone has a tachycardia and it lasts for up to a couple of days or weeks, what happens to the heart is that heart builds extra tissue. It gets swolt up. The problem is it's not like skeletal muscle. If the heart gets enlarged, it performs worse. So this guy's probably got a jacked up big enlarged heart. 
And if I slow his rate down, he's going to have a big problem with that. AFib, A flood are unstable or scary folks to manage. So if you control this dude's rate with your DILT and he drops his blood pressure and becomes altered, you got to be really quick with your inotropes. So he needs dobutamine or milrinone. If you're a critical care, milrinone is fine. If not, dobutamine is a good drug. Do we keep dobutamine? Nobody cares. I know it's an optional drug, though. So the other thing you can do is you can hang some dopamine, get his blood pressure up as well. Or the best thing to do, this dude with the pressure of 110, all right, already looks ill, heart rate of 140, is don't do anything till you get to a place that has these accessory medicines that can salvage this guy if you slow his rate down. But you still, you still got a flutter, but the ventricular response is a lot slower. And now he's in bad shape. Hey, Doc, we do have a question come in before we get too far removed from the subject. Yes, sir. Um, so the question is, do meds like Adderall increase cardiac risk similar to cocaine? Yes, I would say yes. And I may get in trouble for saying that, uh, but is a stimulant, it can do that. Now, appropriate prescribed use probably does not for short to medium term, but inappropriate use, the folks that crush it up and snort it, okay? Recreational use of Adderall, or I would say Adderall use in older populations probably does put you at higher risk for issues. Yes, sir. So you say you got a guy that just snorted a bunch of Adderall or just smoked some crack cocaine and his blood pressure is 280 over 140, heart rate is 120. He's got a big freaking stimmy. He looks like dirt. In addition to our normal cardiac meds, his aspirin, his oxygen, defib pads, all that stuff we talked about earlier, what's another drug would give this guy? There's nobody here to ask. <laughs> so the answer to that is benzos, all right? So Versed, Valium, Ativan, benzos will kind of take away some of the catecholamine surge you get with those cocaine or Adderall drugs like that. So it's not, there's not in our protocols, but if you know that, you call me a control. Hey, doc, I got a 48 year guy, smoked some crack. These are his vitals. Got a stimmy on his 12 to put him in the system. I'm going to give him four Versed to calm him down. Any reasonable ER physician should say, yes, do it. Okay, and you'll see some relief with that. So point to all this second part is AFib, a flutter, unstable patients, hypotensive, altered, look like dirt, are very scary patients to manage because the treatment for them is hard to figure out. And most of the time that treatment can lead you down a pathway where I use inotropes as well. We've talked about changes a lot about what's going to pre-hospital, how we got to start reading our own 12 leads. This was a case recently. This is Birmingham Fire. Give them a shout out. Uh, look at the 12 lead. Rates okay-ish. Reads is 95. I'd say 300, 150, 100. Yeah, I'd say it's close to that. That's reasonable. You look at injury patterns. One AVL and lateral looks reasonable, except for V5 and V6. <laughs> And then 2, 3, and AVF. Big ST elevation. That one might be hard to read. That's a photocopy of a photocopy. So he gets put in the STEMI system, coming into the hospital, goes straight to cath ab. And this is his cath report. All right, so much better. And here's the cool part. We were talking for years about how at the hospital we have 10 minutes to get an EKG when somebody shows up with chest pain or ACS, old person nausea vomiting, that has now moved out to the hospital. So hospitals are looking at your documentation, your PCR, your 12 leads on STEMIs and on NSTEMIs. And NSTEMIs are people who have a heart attack with a normal EKG and positive blood test. So there's no way for you guys to find that out. We find that out in the ER. My point to that is, our charts are being audited now, looked at, which is good. That means we're part of the team with these guys. But EMS, first medical contact, rescue two on scene to EKG was five minutes. They met that goal. EKG done to sent, reasonable time, 10 minutes, all right? And they were in route before they even sent it, all right? In route to UAB, downtown Birmingham, quick transport times, all right? TCC was notified, UAB was notified, cardiology team was hanging out, waiting for him. We have 30 minutes to get them 
upstairs. We made it in 12. We have 90 minutes to get them from door to balloon. That was the old method. All right, so we have 90 minutes from the patient getting to the hospital till we get into cath ab and balloon up. We push that back to 90 minutes from first metal contact to device. So you can see that now instead of looking at times from the hospital to the cath ab, we're looking at times from when you call and say, I'm on scene with patient. So cardiologists are looking at these documentation, looking at your 12 leads. This is fantastic. All right, so this is what we got to do. We got to learn to read our own 12 leads, not just trust the monitor. OK, and we're making a big outcome, big save for this person. This is the fastest uh, EMS to cath ab in the month of July. It was also one of the fastest ER to cath abs because of EMS. So remember, a lot of things in the ER and pre-hospital care we can't fix. A lot of things in medicine we can't fix, right? But there's some things we can make a difference on. We can make a difference in traumatic patients, trauma, managing them, the ABCs. We can make a difference in stroke care. We can make a humongous difference in STEMI care because we have tools that can fix this. We can manage respiratory arrest. We can manage diabetic emergencies. You can make a difference out there. Now, there's some junk out there too. Don't get me wrong, but we need to stay vigilant to manage the patients appropriately so we can make a good outcome for some of them. This one rates a little bit fast in the 140s. I'm looking at injury patterns here. All this looks fine. I got some depression that way. 2, 3 and AVF. V1 through V4. That's very concerning. That's more than one box. That's more than one box. So this would be a posterior STEMI, correct? Correct. Right. I also go back and look at ABR. And again, every EKG I do the same way. I'm going to go back. I'm going to look at intervals. And then I'm going to do one more time injury patterns. But that's a STEMI, right? Posterior STEMI. This one, if there's any patient identifiers on here, guys, please ignore them. I don't think there is. Um, so this one, too fast, too slow, or okay. I saw the rate's okay-ish. It's irregular. And I tell that by hand on the patient's pulse. I'm looking at injury patterns, like always. V1 through V4. I got this stuff right here, right? So it looks like a posterior STEMI. I look here, all right? The difference is this is not a posterior STEMI, but it's got ST depression. That's because this is a right bundle. So that's the tease. We're going to talk about right bundles next time. That's moving a little bit deeper in depth. So you realize this is a right bundle versus the STEMI. Here's another one. Looking at the injury patterns. AVL is up. I'm down here, 2, 3, and ABF concerning V1 through V4. All right, so this is a big STEMI. Machine doesn't read it. We're up here, we're up laterally. Big STEMI. But the machine doesn't say it, but you should pick that up. Here's another one. Rate looks reasonable. We're up here. All right, we're down laterally. So you can say, yeah, it looks like a big septal anterior STEMI, right? But you can't because this is a left bundle branch block. It changes the rules. So next time we'll do a basic uh, cardiac case again, the STEMIs, and then we'll break out into left bundles and right bundles. Remember, the only way you get better at 12 leads is to look at a lot of them. You can't do one or shift. Wave Maven's a good resource. Life in the fast lane, another good resource on the uh, internet. All right, uh, but we got to start being able to read these and interpret these guys. All right. If I said anything inappropriate, I apologize. If I said something that sounds wrong or medically not sound, don't do it. Look it up. There's some days I'm confused as well. We're going to take a five minute break and come back and talk about sepsis. And thank you for smiling. Maybe. Thanks, everybody. We're going to take a short break and then come back with Dr. Rose on a, a lecture on sepsis. Remember, the link to the attendance form is in the uh, Q&A chat box online. You can click on it directly and fill out your attendance form, or you can send an email to Alabama, I'm sorry, yeah, Alabama EMS Challenge at gmail.com. You'll get an automated reply 
with a link to the tenants forum. We'll see you back here in just a few minutes. Hey everybody, we're going to get started back. Uh, we're glad to have Dr. Amy Rose here with us today and she's going to talk to us about sepsis. So thanks for being here, Dr. Rose. Take it away. Happy to be here. Um, so just a little bit of background about me. Uh, my name is Amy Rose. I'm one of the second year emergency medicine residents over at UAB and obviously whenever you come to the department, she's the one with the weird accent. She talks funny. You probably got me. Um, so just before coming to UAB, um, I've been here for about 10 years now, was a medic in the Air Force, did that um, for four years down in Arizona, um, that was a great time, and then ran fire rescue in the civilian world in Virginia, did that for a bit, bit of time, and now I'm here, so hopefully I'll be able to stay around and get familiar with everybody, meet everybody. Um, but anyway, back to the topic, uh, so we're going to be talking a little bit about sepsis, and um, just kind of, I have no disclaimers to know. What we're gonna be talking about is kind of what is sepsis? What do we care about sepsis? And specifically like, what are we gonna be doing about sepsis as it pertains to the field? So recognizing it, knowing what we can do to treat it, and then we can kind of talk over a little bit of cases that I have towards the end here. Um, so I always like to describe sepsis as like the appendix of the immune system. Like it's probably got some good function somewhere. You know, you've got a bit of a heart rate elevation, a little bit of a fever, that's helpful. But then when it gets out of control, well, now we've got a problem, we need to take it out. And that's pretty much what sepsis is. It's like your immune system tries to be helpful, but then it just goes completely overboard. Um, so what kind of happens is, you get what's called a systemic inflammatory response. And that's one of the, the big kind of definitions that we look for, especially with us being residents as well. Um, and what are these? So it's ways that the body kind of responds to the infection that kind of blows it out of proportion. And one or two of these is OK. You know, even being septic, like that's not actually a bad thing until you start to have organ dysfunction. And we kind of want to just identify it treat the infection before it even has the chance to go there. So SARS, we'll start with temperature. That's a big one. So I know some units can um, have a thermometer, some units don't. Um, and the temperature is less than 36 or greater than 38. Um, but this is America, so we deal with Fahrenheit here. So less than 96.8 and greater than 100.4. And that's not 100.4, that's greater than. So we always want to remember if we start to see somebody with, you know, fever and never ever forget low temperature also counts as sepsis. So if you've got a little old lady that's in the nursing home and you take her temperature and she's 96.2, always kind of think about it, have it on your radar, because um, she could potentially be sepsis, especially from a nursing home. And then we've got our heart rate above 90, so that's not inclusive of 90. Respiration rate above 20, again, not inclusive of 20. And then looking at a white count, well, we don't really care about a white count in the field, right? It's not like you guys are running CBCs out there. But definitely like a lot of this comes from vitals. Two or more will trigger sepsis. So two or more plus obviously the infection will trigger, you know, is this sepsis? There's also uh, another one called Q-SOFA. And I just wanted to put this up there just to kind of show you there's different ones and there's mu's and news and it all kind of revolves around the same thing is is the heart rates going up is the respiratory rates going up are we getting fever are they altered like do we have signs of something going wrong with the body we've already talked a little bit about so so that's this inflammatory response and then we got our nasty infection and this is more than like it doesn't even necessarily need to be a bacterial infection so you can have like a viral infection like the flu and also be septic. And then something we don't often think about in the field is fungal infections. So when you pick up those patients and they have like the catheters and the lines and they're getting like tube feeds and all kinds of crazy stuff, fungal infections um, can also, you know, potentially cause um, sepsis and they're pretty nasty ones to treat. 
but you have those, you automatically, by definition, will sepsis. And one of the big things is that, okay, now we've got somebody and we want to give them some fluids because we know that their blood pressure is probably going to be low and we'll talk a little bit more about why. They're requiring some vasopressors or, you know, when we get them to the hospital and their lactic's above two, uh, well, then we start to have problems because now we're starting to get towards septic shock. Um, and when we talk about lactic, like what is lactic? Like everybody's like, don't get a lactic in the ED. Like don't order that lactic unless you know what you're going to do with it. But what is it? So usually your body requires a certain amount of oxygen. Just sitting here, obviously we're breathing. We have basic metabolic just kind of rate that requires it. And when you have some kind of mismatch where your body needs a lot of oxygen and you're not able to get it or if say your body is ramped up in terms of like metabolic activity because of the infection and you're just not able to breathe in enough or there's even some mechanisms we don't even fully understand that can cause a mismatch and then we switch over to anaerobic respiration and anaerobic um, breakdown so we tend to get lactic as a byproduct of that. This is pretty much just the hey we've got to talk about the science at some point so we've got our infectious trigger We've got our kind of body's response to that. Our body's response kind of damages us. And then after that, we kind of see the effects when we come to a scene and a patient's present uh, presenting to us and we realize, wow, that patient has a heart rate in the 130s and their blood pressure is 79 over 43. And we're like, hmm, you know, it's probably sepsis. So just to talk a little bit more about kind of what that is in terms of visual stuff. So I do emergency medicine, right? The reason I do emergency medicine is because I just like to get out there and do things. I'm not one of these, let's sit down and think for a thousand hours. I'm not like an internal medicine. I'm very visual, I like to do things. So I figured I'd put this up there. So we have our vessels and what tends to happen, and it's the same thing with anaphylactic shock as well. You tend to get what leaky vessels. So you have endothelial damage. The blood starts to go, um, the plasma starts to seep out, and then you start to get low intravascular volumes. And then that's when we start to see the issues with oxygen delivery, as well as like third spacing and hypotension and just general suck shock. And we do as much as we can in the emergency department to kind of compact that. So we'll give a bunch of fluid, we'll see if we can give them presses if they're not responding to the fluid to see if we can kind of close that gap. So. And why do we care about it? This is an expensive sucker, so it costs a lot on the system um, as well as it's patients don't seem to just get a, some antibiotics and then immediately we can discharge them home. Some mild things like if somebody comes in with a toe infection and they're in pain and their heart rates up and we control it and they're still a little bit tacky, yeah, they're sepsis and maybe they can probably go home with um, just some, you know, oral antibiotics. But most of these people are sick and they need to come in for IV stuff. Um, there's a, around a 15 to 20 percent in hospital mortality just from initial presentation and it keeps people in the ICU long and it keeps people in the hospital long and especially when we're missing it. So that's the big thing is that uh, uh, some of these patients aren't as straightforward as, hey, I've got a raging UTI and I'm febrile and I'm super sick or hey, I've got this like raging pneumonia, I've been coughing up a bunch of gunk. Sometimes it can be real tricky. It's also really expensive on the system as well. So a lot of people, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, um, those days in the ICU, they add up and that, you know, overall puts a big strain on the system. So the sooner we can identify it, the sooner we can treat these people and we, the sooner we can treat these people, um, the best it is for, you know, the economy in general, as well as for the patient's care. And again, um, this is from national data, just pretty much showing um, the national cost here is in green and sepsis is right up there if you compare it. $24 billion we spend on, on sepsis um, treatment and just kind of hospitalizations. <clears throat> and this is the big one for us. When we're in the department, it, you two, it really, really kind of dictates everything that we do. We have a large population of patients who are Medicaid, Medicare, um, and CMS puts out these guidelines where if you don't meet these metrics, guess what, you're not getting paid. So we need to keep the lights on. 
we need to pay my resident budget, we need to pay Dr Ferguson's budget, otherwise you'll get no more uh, talks um, every week. So uh, what do they kind of set forth as like standards for septic patients? And this is really it. This is the current treatment guidelines from the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. So we do uh, kind of go by what they want us to do. And within an hour, they want us to have that lactic measured, get blood cultures before antibiotics. Very important because you don't want them to kind of alter it and then get IV antibiotics on board. Within three hours, they want us to give 30 cc's per kilogram of IV fluids. Make sure that their MAP stays above 65 and then frequently reassess them. And most of the times we are frequently reassessing. And if there's any change, you know, you'd probably notice it if you've got them on the monitor. But this is a real big one. Like, yeah. So we need to make sure that we are kind of identifying these patients so we can give them fluids. The 30 cc's per kilogram is very controversial. Nobody knows where that number came from. There's no evidence for it. But guess what? CMS wants it, so we try and do it as best we can. But there's always considerations for it. So when we get like Gammy on the unit and she's septic, we don't want to pound her with the 30 cc's because especially this is ideal body weight. That's really important to know. It's not, you know, regular body weight. We've got to make sure we're taking into consideration that this is actually based on height um, because that can equal a lot of liters when it all adds up. Uh, so that's one big thing is identifying to know who should we be giving fluids for. Now, whether you do saline or LR, that's a that's a different topic in itself. But being able to at least give them some IV fluids in the appropriate setting um, is going to be helpful. Things that we should be thinking about is, is this patient a heart failure patient? That's a real big one for us um, to be thinking about, to kind of know, hey, don't give those people, they can't push it forward from the left side of the heart the same way that somebody with a healthy heart can. So what tends to happen is if you're not pushing it forward from the left side of the heart, when it gets there, it's just going to kind of seep up in the lungs, it's going to kind of go to the right side of the body, and now you've got somebody in flash pulmonary edema because they just can't compensate for their poor squeeze. Dr. Rose, yeah. what's the time frame on that massive bolus of fluid? Is this something that they're like really trying to get in fast, like pressure infusers? Yeah. yeah, so they want the 30 cc's um, in. That's for patients that show signs of hypotension, but they do want fluids on period on people. And a lot of the time it's OK for us to say, hey, it doesn't really make sense to give them the 30 cc's and here's why. Um, and then you can kind of explain it. It's a risk risk kind like risk pro benefit type situation. Uh, if I give somebody 30 cc's per kilogram, they've got heart failure, they're a kidney patient. Guess what? That ain't going to end well for both of us. Sure, maybe you'll help their shock and their hypoperfusion state, but now you've also compromised their cardiovascular system and their respiratory. Um, so you want to try and identify and in a young, healthy person, get that on as fast as possible and then obviously consider the patients who you might want to be OK with just like a 500 cc or a uh, thousand cc. Um, I'm sorry, we do have a question. Just yeah. in. So um, one of our participants says, I read an article in the New England Journal of Medicine about a doctor treating patients in New England with high dose vitamin C, no antibiotics and curing the sepsis in two or three days. Do you know anything about this? Would not recommend. Um, I would say that we at least want to get antibiotics on board. I know that that used to be like an old uh, thought process to go ahead and give the vitamin C. It's not usually practiced now. I don't routinely give it. I don't know if Dr. Ferguson gives it, um, but we do not do that in the ED. Would that be a supplement they do? So that'd be something that may be used in the intensive care unit. It's not a standard of care, so we would not do it. And you know, there's some people out there that get better from sepsis if we did nothing. Now that's not many people that would do that, right? So I'm not sure about these cases of the vitamin C. There's also been cases in the past where people have used methylene blue, which is a kind of a dye to treat severe sepsis as kind of an end game. And there's some case reports those folks do better too. So there may be something there, but it's not something we're gonna do in the ER 
for a standard because it's just not standard of care. And the thing on the 30 cc's per kilo, so this is all where medicine is, some people in medicine are trying to put us more in a protocol driven world, just like EMS has been kind of bound down to. And if you know my thoughts, I'm trying to get us away from this protocol driven world, right? Um, and there are early studies of sepsis, uh, ER doc named uh, Manny Rivers did some work that said that but with sepsis, you get vasodilatation, you get fluids, and increases perfusion, people have better outcomes. And so that's where this 30 cc per kilo came from. But like Dr. Rhodes was saying, some people can't tolerate that fluid. If you have a dialysis patient that missed dialysis two days, or somebody with heart failure, and you give them 30 cc's per kilo of fluid, you're basically going to put them in pulmonary edema. So there's got to be some common medical sense applied to this. And if you look at some of this newer data, they're saying that maybe we don't need to give everybody all this fluid anyway. We just start early based oppressors. But again, the government's way behind on that. Government wants us to do protocol driven care. And if we don't give somebody 30 cc's per kilo and we diagnose them with sepsis, they will not pay the bill for that hospitalization. So just like you guys got documentation, things y'all got to put down for your billing and so forth, we do too, or we get deemed. So help me understand this. Dr. Rose, so in sepsis, we're seeing the vasodilation shock, distributed shock. Yep. We're also seeing an increase in capillary permeability or the mm -hmm. leaky vessels that's causing the fluid to go into the interstitial space or the third space. Mm -hmm. So the patient swells up, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't have enough circulating volume. So that's the thought behind giving the fluids. Mm -hmm. And the thought behind giving the pressors is to constrict the peripheral vasculature, the mm -hmm. peripheral blood vessels. Are there any drugs or pharmaceuticals that keep that, that reduce or reverse the capillary permeability? Um, in this, so the answer is yes, there is. There is medications out there that we can give that can help kind of pull that fluid back in to the vessels. Does it have a place in sepsis now? We have not looked at that. Um, it's kind of different pathological processes. Um, and specifically, I'm thinking if we're talking more about redistributing all that fluid, that's kind of third space and then bring, pulling it back in. One, we need to think about other kidneys functioning because if they have functioning kidneys, well, when by the time this is resolved or, you know, the patient is kind of getting back on their feet, their kidneys are amazing little beings. They'll be able to really kind of get rid of that fluid and it shouldn't be that much of an issue. Um, when you start to have patients like the liver patients who you know have low proteins and they can't hold it on and then you give them sepsis on top of it um, then it kind of gets a little bit more complicated but that's kind of what we'll handle more towards the ICU even like in the ED we rarely are given albumin unless it's a very specific uh, patient population we primarily focus on doing the IV fluids and then if it's refractory then we'll switch over to the pressors. What about hypertonic? Um, so hypertonic saline has its risks. Um, so I haven't routinely used hypertonic saline. Um, have you, Dr. Ferguson? No, I think again it goes back to risk. Mm -hmm. Somebody who has sepsis and they're dehydrated, their volume down. When you give them just normal saline, regular IV fluid, it's going to be hypertonic, so they're fluid already. That makes sense because their fluid's already going to be less sodium. So when you give them normal saline, it's a little bit hypertonic anyway. Um, so we're not using a lot of hypertonic stuff. The the big cause of this, this uh, one of the theories behind this big cause of low blood pressure and vasodilatation is the toxins from the the uh, the bug that's attacking them, right? The uh, bacteria. So the way you fix that is you get rid of the bacteria, and you used to do that with antibiotics. The problem is sometimes when you start people on antibiotics. You kill off a bunch of the bacteria real quick, and those bacteria burst open and release toxins in the bloodstream. So you get a rapid drop in blood pressure, and you get a big response from that. So it's it's not exact science. It's kind of tricky. Everybody's a little bit different depending on what bug they have and what their state is. And that's really the whole point of this talk, because it's not to be like, hey, here's sepsis. It's all clear cut. It is probably one of the most complicated pathological processes that we deal with, just because it presents differently in everybody. The bacteria are different. The sepsis presentation depends on what organ is affected. So it really is like it's missed a lot because it can be very uh, just under the radar, like 
easy to miss. So, um, so yeah, um, trying to recognise and at least getting some fluids on board um, in those patients showing signs of hypotension or refractory shock uh, is always I'd recommend. The big causes of infection that we look for, bladder, lungs and the skin. So when you have someone you go up on scene, um, just it's best even when they're confused is to just ask family members, just have it on your radar, like could this be sepsis? Always ask, are they, hey, have you noticed they've been peeing more lately? Have they been you know, peeing on themselves? Uh, have they been coughing more? Uh, are they, have they been gasping for air? Have you noticed them sitting up funny? Or hey, have you noticed any redness, any rash, any drainage from anywhere? Just kind of asking family for collateral because you have no idea how much it helps us. Uh, when we get them and you know we're not able to have the family there right now and um, you guys you know really are the source of information that can help piece together um, the picture and help us guide towards what we should actually be doing right for the patient in a timely manner so um, so I did want to go through like some cases to just kind of explain like hey this isn't as straight clear cut forward uh, so you've got an 85 year old female um, she's got a past medical history of high blood pressure. She's got strokes. She's got diabetes. Like, how many calls have you been on like this? And you walk up, and grand, like the granddaughter's outside. She's freaking out, and she's like, "Gummy ain't acting right. She's just not acting right." And that's really all you got. Like, she's got no car. She called EMS for transportation. You go inside, and Gammy's like sitting, <laughs> sitting on a rocking chair, and uh, you go in say hey gammy you know what's been going on i don't know that ray gun you can already tell you know she's not quite in our time zone maybe she is i don't know um so she, she's clearly confused on your exam so you get a set of vitals you see heart rate is 89 respiration 21 temperature of 100.4 and then systolic is 94. So big things is that this is technically low grade in terms of sepsis. Low grade fever doesn't actually trigger sepsis. I still always have it on my radar though. And then the one says on here would be that respiration rate of 21. So technically by definition, just looking at this, you've got an elderly who's confused. You're not going to have the information to know like, does she definitively have a UTI? Like what does that urinalysis actually show? Or like, what does that chest X-ray show? And obviously you can get a good exam. Um, by listening to the lungs and seeing if there's any like diminished breath sounds anywhere. But one big thing that you always need to be aware of is how medications can mask potential sepsis. So when you find out that GAM is actually on metoprolol, well now maybe she probably is septic. So that 89 is probably a little bit higher and now we've pushed her over more into like the sepsis criteria. So you won't be able to again diagnose it because you don't really know what the process is. But when you've got someone acutely acting altered and they've got like low grade fevers and there's a potential for any kind of medication that can mask. Say she's got really bad knee pain and she's been chowing down on ibuprofen for the past three days and she last took one an hour ago. Well, then that's also, you know, something to consider. So just kind of take taking like it's not this set of numbers. It's really about critical thinking, critical care thinking of is there anything that could be potentially confound in the picture where GAMI is actually pretty septic. The next case is, so we have a 29 year old male with a past medical history of lymphoma on chemo, actively being treated. And he's like, I got the sweats and I just feel weak. OK, you got the sweats and you just feel weak. You take his temperature. OK, that meets sepsis. Um, everything else actually seems pretty good, though. Um, you do notice that he does look sick. He looks like, you know, cancer patient on chemo, but he's not having any respiratory distress. Maybe looks a little bit pale, but nothing too bad. Um, should you guys be thinking sepsis? Who knows? Well, your guy's job is probably a lot harder than mine because I get to make decisions based on a lot more information. You know, I get there. I don't have to decide kind of what to treat until I see um, all the, you know, facts coming together unless they're obviously crashing. So I get a white count of 33. So that automatically I'm like, OK, we've got something going on. You look at the last one and the white count was seven, which is normal. 
or you look back and the white count was 42 and it's just part of the cancer process. Um, but say the last one was seven, well now we've got sepsis because we have a white count and we have fever. And again, this isn't to say like you guys should know this. This is additional information that you don't have, but always keep it on your radar for immunocompromised. That's the whole point of this slide is there's people that are on chemo, anybody with like HIV, uh, anybody on steroids, like these people can potentially be uh, infectious and even if they don't typically present as it, just always have it on your radar, this could potentially be. So whenever you get a patient with a history of prostate cancer, it's helpful to just say, hey, are they actively undergoing any treatment now? Or, you know, a lung cancer, hey, have they had any chemo recently? Just kind of asking those questions really helps us out a lot, so. And then another one, so you've got a 71 year old male, he's got a history of prostate cancer, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and chief complaint is Pop Pop just keeps hitting people with the stick. He's always peeing on himself. What? Pop Pop, you know, what's going on? So you get in there and Pop Pop's in there, waving the stick around, acting all crazy, you know, trying to bat everybody away, hallucinating, you know, touching the space cowboys in the sky. You get his vitals, he's tachycardic, his heart, his respiratory rate is up, everything else seems okay. He's not undergoing any kind of cancer treatment, um, but he meets sepsis technically. Um, he's peeing on himself, so have UTI kind of on the differential. And then he's elderly as well, which is a, a big one. So, you know, these are populations that kind of take special consideration. So the elderly with encephalopathy, the immunocompromised for whatever reason, they're on chemo, uh, they're on steroids, they're on, uh, they just have a disease that kind of bumps their immune system. Always think about, you know, could this be sepsis and how will it present? Um, and this is kind of my last slide to really kind of bring this all together to give you a take home point of nobody's expecting you to get it 100% of the time. I barely get it probably 60% of the time. It's missed a lot. It can be confusing. You don't find out later. Even when you get blood cultures and they're all negative, people can still be septic up to 30% of the time when people present and we get cultures and we admit them and give them antibiotics. They show no culture data or no culture growth, but that doesn't mean the septic, like it gets missed a lot. So just learning how to recognize it, thinking about these special populations, the heart failure patients, the dialysis patients who don't have the ability to just pee off excess fluid like we do, you know, they need a machine to pull that off. Um, it's okay not to have 30 cc's per kilogram, but if you see someone that could probably benefit from fluids and you think the septic, it's probably not a bad idea to just give them a baby, a baby little bolus, a little 500 cc, to just see if it can help them out. Um, and with that, Talk briefly about this recently, Texas. Sure. Yeah. One of the yeah. things I ran into early yeah. in my career, a patient was invited to meet me, and I'm like, young paramedic, and this was a couple of days ago, and but was most definitely. You know, yeah. a nursing home patient with a catheter and pretty much so nasty urine see. and just, mm -hmm. you know, but looking at the monitor, like, oh, we're supposed to treat this, but on the other side. Yeah. You know. So this actually really goes well with Ferg's talk is when he talked about like atrial fibrillation and you have, you know, these dysrhythmias that come up. It's really kind of if you've had someone that's been sinus rhythm or, you know, for whatever reason, what happened? that triggered them to bump over into an abnormal rhythm. Have they missed any medication doses? Um, are they stable right now? Do they have any signs of infection? And that's a really good point. Nursing home patients, that really should be in the forefront of your mind. Obviously, if there's an acute mental status change and you know stroke, that would, should also be thought about. But the nursing homes are notorious um, for having a high rate of sepsis coming from there from their population, but they can present in a whole bunch of, of arrhythmias. And most of the time it's sinus tachycardia. That will be a big one, a good old narrow complex, regular sinus tachycardia, but it can trigger them to be an AFib. But if they have a history of it and they've, you know, they're on medications, they're amlodipine or 
uh, carvedilol or whatever, metoprolol, whatever they've been on at home, um, and they get septic, it can, you know, cause them to have a flare. And you don't need to rush to go and straight, like, let's give them a dentist cardiovert. You just got to treat the problem. You got to treat the sepsis. So as long as their blood pressure is fine, as long as they're not, you know, in a rhythm that's so fast that they're not going to perfuse, it's okay to kind of just hold off a little bit. Can you want to comment a little bit about the dementia patient? The early indicators of sepsis or infection yeah. on how how much they really will change they'll be at this state and yeah you know I always, that's our yeah. early identifier or at least in my experience mm -hmm. it's I, I always tell the elderly and the young folks they present the same a lot of the time so if you've got someone and they're at baseline and all of a sudden they change You've got Gammy who she's demented, but she's pleasantly demented, and now she's throwing bricks at people. Well, you know, maybe we should get Gammy checked out. And likewise, on the other end of the spectrum, if you have like a two month old who's otherwise doing fine, and now they're acting crazy and screaming and crying and they're febrile, you know, you don't always have to run them, you know, immediate, immediately down to the emergency department. But that is how they can also present as well. A UTI, a simple UTI, um, can also cause a lot of encephalopathy in these kids as well, or responsiveness, or you know, agitation. So uh, any kind of med and the best person to ask this for is the family. So the family is going to be number one because, hey, I just get them a quick a quick snap. Like I don't know anything about them. You probably don't know anything about them. You're just responding, and like we're both like, I don't know what this patient is like at baseline. The family information will tell you a whole bunch. So, so when you think about uh, talk, they're talking about the toxins that cause the hypotension of these folks. Those same toxins sometimes can cross that blood-brain barrier we talked about with excited delirium. So there may be a toxin this bacteria secretes that makes them get hypotension. You get vasodilatation. That same toxin can cross the brain and make somebody just get really weirded out and, and, and delirious, combative, change of personality, things like that. So that can lead to that. Something else to think about, if someone, for example, has had a stroke in the past and then they kind of recover from the stroke. So they have left side of weakness and now they're home, they're doing better, they get rehab, they're back up. You really don't see a big deficit. Now they get sick, infected, and septic. Um, those toxins can jack up and make them kind of uh, relive the stroke symptom. I, think, I can't think of a good word. What's the word we use? I just lost it. But in short version, they can go back and have those same stroke deficits. And it's not a new stroke, it's the old stroke coming back because of the toxins and the low blood pressure and the poor perfusion of the brain where that stroke was to begin with. There's a fancy medical term we use, and I just lost I don't it. Know what I'm, yeah. not, I'm not smart as you, Dr. Folks. So. <laughs> I don't know. I yeah. didn't get told that. Uh, yeah, no comment on that. Yeah, we, we don't do fancy medical terms. Yeah, yeah. no, sorry. <laughs> so, so it's a foregone conclusion if somebody has yeah. a Foley catheter for a long time that they're bound to have a UTI. I mean, is that like a 99% at three weeks out? What's your experience there? Because we have a jaded experience. We go to nursing home patients all yeah. the time. Most of them are catheterized and yeah. most of them have a UTI when we see them. Yeah. But here's the problem, though, is that a lot of the times, even in the ED, when we get these nursing home patients come in, the nurse will go straight to get the urine sample. And guess what? She pulls it straight from that bag, which has been sitting there and it's probably got a lot of bacteria in it. So the first thing is uh, switching out the Foley. Let's get a new Foley in there. Let's get a completely new urine sample and see if we still have that same UTI. So but to bring it back is. Well, yes, a lot of the time the nursing home patients get UTIs is one, was that a good enough sample? And two, they probably actually did have UTIs because I don't know when the last time it was changed. You know, a lot of the time, you know, they're supposed to be dated if it's a chronic lung, you know, indwelling Foley. A lot of the times they come in and there's no date on it. So I don't know if it's been there for three days, if it's been there for three weeks, like who knows? It's got a bunch of crud on it. I don't know. I don't want to touch it. Like, let's just replace it and get see what we're dealing with. So. Anytime you have anything artificial in the body that's a risk for infection. Yeah. So an IV that stays in for eight days, risk mm -hmm. of infection. Foley catheter for you know seven days, ten days, sometimes two days, who knows? Risk for infection. Mm -hmm. You know, an LVAM, a drive line going to your heart, risk for infection. A central line for dialysis always puts you at high risk for infection because it's something foreign to your body. Ventilator associated pneumonia from an ET two. Yeah, because you got something shoved in your lungs, right? Mm -hmm. So there, so I wanted to mention something. 
We still got time, yeah. So I've had questions about doing sepsis codes or uh, a sepsis protocol for EMS. I know some states and regions do that. I think it's reasonable for a sepsis alert. So if you recognize a patient has sepsis, you don't have to call it in on the radio. But when you get to the hospital, you tell the nursing staff and the patient is septic and hypotensive. You find that doc and tell them because they have core measures, time frames they have to get or they get deemed. So if you use that catchphrase, hey, this patient on the wall has been in 45 minutes, you know, they're 70, their urine bag looks like dirt, they're hypertensive, tachycardic and febrile, they're septic. That's going to get them off the wall because those numbers start when you get there. So that can help you with that. Um, and that's that actually a really good point because we as residents, unless they're in a room, like I don't know about them. Like I don't see and I don't see that name there because there's so many people in the waiting room and on the wall that I don't have time to go through each one of them. So even pulling me aside and being like, hey, can you just take another look at this patient? You know, she's febrile acting crazy, then it might expedite getting into a room and reducing those wall times. Exactly. So at UAB, never be shy. Always find a person in gray scrubs yeah. and talk to them. Okay. If you have issues, reach out to us. We can take care of that. Other hospitals, I can tell you the same way, and maybe a little bit grumpier at times. Because at UAB, we're blessed. We have three or four residents, three or four regular doctors, and then other people. Some hospitals only have one person working at night, so they may be overwhelmed. But if you tell them, I got a septic patient on the wall, their mind's thinking, okay, one, that person is sick, and two, if I don't make these core measures, I'm going to get a nasty email in a couple of days. So let them know what's going on. That helps you a lot. I don't think from a sepsis alert, we should be giving antibiotics in the field at this point in the game. When we move towards some agencies or some units doing advanced practice, that's reasonable. But right now, if y'all carried one antibiotic and get everybody the antibiotic that you thought was septic, and two years from now, the antibiotic will be useless in the Greater Birmingham area because of resistance and us giving it to people that don't have sepsis. Um, so I think the, the mainstay of therapy is ABCs, aggressive fluid resuscitation, if they're hypotensive, if they're hypotensive and don't respond to fluid to have a long transport time, consider vasopressors, your dopamine, or make an epi infusion if you want to call med control. Those work pretty reasonable and have limited risk and good benefit for the patients. Um, but I think antibiotics in the field at this point are probably we're not there until we get uh, more advanced practice units out there so we don't get this resistance to drugs. And they did actually recently publish an article in The Lancet, which is like the UK version of the New England Journal. I think it was like a land back in 2018 that actually looked at giving everybody who was suspected sepsis like a gram of recepin just in the field, like just give them a gram of recepin. And it actually didn't show any kind of mortality or inpatient benefit. Um, so I think especially with the risks of side effects from the medications, one, because nothing is benign, even oxygen, you know, fluids can cause harm, um, especially something like recephin um, or any kind of antibiotic always has the risk. And then when you've got the potential to breed any kind of resistance whatsoever, it's probably best to just kind of hold in transport. So, yeah. Throw another thing out here. A lot of our people are getting home, home antibiotic therapy. Yep. Of course, we've got the risk for anaphylaxis. Mm -hmm. Anything else to throw out there, maybe for our medics and pre-hospital care providers to consider? I don't think so. A lot of the times when we send people home on antibiotics, they've received a good few doses of it um, already prior to, to leaving. So, um, I mean, just like with any of these kind of immune modulating agents that people are going home with and getting infusions, there's always that risk. You just treat it the exact same way. It will be ABCs. Um, yeah. So. I would think that you are transporting somebody that has a big line, like a pig line or something in, they get antibiotics. When you transport them, grab their bag of antibiotics, and then we know oh, what yeah. they're on. That could be useful for us because all these antibiotics, not just anaphylaxis, they have side effects. So vancomycin may cause them to have renal failure and not through other medicines. And now they're bradycardic and hypotensive because they're on a beta blocker and we just knocked out their kidneys and they can't clear it. So that information is always useful. The other thing to think about is, Let's say you have a patient that's being treated with anti uh, antibiotics for an infection and they know, normally go to hospital B in the city, okay? And you load them up, start heading that way, then we go to hospital B, and hospital B is on divert. I would still say that they go to that hospital because otherwise they're going to go to hospital A and we're not going to know why they're on those antibiotics or what's going on. And remember, diversion is just a kind of, hey, heads up, uh, we're kind of busy. Um, but if someone is attached to a hospital for a chronic problem, you're better off than going there. It's going to save a lot of money, a lot of time as well, especially surgical patients. patients. 
what happens? It's also good for the patients. It's all, it is you good know the patients. history, you kind of know what the positions are, they can follow them, the main patients are. Yeah, yeah, it was good for the patient unless they're on an ambulance stretcher for 18 hours in the ED. Awesome. Right, that's when you go to that position and tell them right. what's going on with exactly. that patient. And that's where we also we need to track these wall times and get them back to us at Brown so we can help with this. Obviously, nobody wants wall times, but I can tell you that if I went to an administrator right now and said, hey, if your ER is on divert, would you try to expedite care and get your established patient taken care of? Their answer would be yes. So we just got to get this data and get it to the hospital administrators that can make those changes, so to speak. So if I had surgery at hospital A and then I had a big, uh, was hypertensive kind of issues with it, and you took it to hospital B, this, no surgeon's going to correct the other surgical issue because that's just not what happens in America. And that's also, so I actually trained at Virginia Tech and we had the sepsis alert. So we had a code sepsis and then a sepsis alert. And EMS, you know, I did like research into how we can kind of help, you know, improve sepsis in the pre-hospital setting. But the sepsis alert actually kind of triggered the nurses to want to make a room available if they kind of felt that it was appropriate. Um, and also they already had like the blood culture set up. They had antibiotics ready to hang, but not hanging and then obviously as soon as they got there you know they would let the physician know the physician would immediately come to bedside and then decide hey are we going to code sepsis or not um and again that's just kind of like where i kind of trained us from my medical school and so there is you know those systems out there any other questions from the world no no questions yet dr person dr rose thank you all so much great lecture today thank you for taking your time to help us get better and understand a little bit more and thanks to everybody who signed in to participate. That's all we've got for, the, for this uh, session. See everybody in two weeks. Come say hi. <laughs> Come say hi. Come say hi.